Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I guess if you see me wearing long trousers, you know it's a bit of a giveaway. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's move to the next slide. Edith Eager was a 16-year-old ballerina and gymnast when she was sent to Auschwitz in 1944. There she endured unimaginable experiences, including being made to dance before the infamous Joseph Mengele. When the camp was finally liberated, an American soldier plucked her from a pile of bodies, barely alive. She then had to work out how to live a life after all she had seen and all she had suffered. She trained as a psychologist, where she learned to help others come to terms with the trauma and the pain in their lives, and to guide them to freedom. In so doing, she found the strength and resilience to survive her past and to heal herself. The choice is her inspirational story and a philosophical reflection of how we can think about events that happen to us, and she sums it up like this. We cannot choose to have a life free of hurt, but we can choose to be free, to escape the past, no matter what befalls us, and to embrace the possible. Nadia Murad is a courageous young Yazidi woman, raised, and raised in Kocho, a small village of farmers and shepherds in northern Iraq. Her dream of becoming a history teacher or opening a beauty salon ended on August the 15th, 2014, when Islamic State militants massacred the people of her village. Six of Nadia's brothers and her mother were killed. Nadia was taken to Mosul and forced along with thousands of other Yazidi girls into the ISIS sex slave trade. She was held captive and exchanged among several militants and repeatedly raped, tortured, and beaten. Finally, she managed a narrow escape through the streets of Mosul, finding shelter in the home of a Sunni Muslim whose eldest son risked his life to smuggle her to safety in Germany. Today, as a Yazidi, a refugee from a lost country, and a fragile community, a family torn apart by war, a survivor of rape as a weapon of war, as the goodwill ambassador for the dignity of survivors of human trafficking, and a co-recipient of the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize, Nadia is forcing the world to pay attention to ongoing genocide and, quote, to be the last girl in the world with a story like mine. Nikki Nichols was abandoned by her mother as a newborn in a cardboard box outside Stoke City football ground. Her grandparents took her into their home, but instead of finding a sanctuary, Nikki was subjected to horrific sexual abuse throughout her childhood by her grandfather and uncle, and was constantly told she was not a proper child. She joined the army but was unable to fit in and found herself a homeless alcoholic in and out of prison for decades before eventually ending up in a mental institution where a prison warder discovered and encouraged her writing and artistic talent. Today, in her 70s, she is an internationally renowned London artist whose extraordinary survival from the horror of a deeply damaging childhood to a new, creative, and independent life gives hope for other abused children. <clears throat> Having recently read these three stories of desolation and despair, I found myself asking the question, is it possible to find hope in the darkness? Is it possible to find hope in the darkness? Can you believe God is good when life is not? 
After all, when you look around, you see countless people you know. Or maybe you personally are suffering with health issues, with a battered and bruised relationship, retrenchment, financial stress, addiction, or some other unbearable circumstance. You pray, and nothing happens. You wonder if God has turned a deaf ear. If you can lift your gaze off your own struggles, the world is ravaged by injustices, war, poverty and hunger, natural disasters, corruption, poor governance, and so much death, destruction, and hopelessness. You pray too, and the problems are so immense you wonder, where is God in all of this? Habakkuk was confronted with the same conundrum. His book starts with a man's crisis of belief. He believes, and yet he questions. It ends with a towering expression of faith, scarcely equaled anywhere else in the Old Testament. So what I'd like to do this morning is to just take us through a whistle-stop tour of this particular book, because it helps us to transition from doubt to living with faith and hope in the darkness. In chapter 1, Habakkuk protests when he looks at his world full of violence, injustice, destruction, strife, and conflict. And yet God seems to him to be doing nothing about it. He saw suffering and complained, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? He was saying essentially, Why are you missing in action, God? Why don't you care? Why aren't you doing something? Why is this so unfair? Why? 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 The kind of why questions that we can all identify with. God's reply was that he was going to do something so utterly amazing and unexpected. He was going to raise up the Babylonians, a ruthless and impetuous people, to destroy Israel because of her wickedness, sending the the remnants into a long period of exile. Habakkuk was perplexed and he was fearful. Surely God was in control of history and all-powerful? How could a pure God use the cruel and idolatrous Babylonians to punish a godly nation? Surely he couldn't be serious. But God never says we can't ask honest questions. And that's why Habakkuk's name means to wrestle. And so we, like Habakkuk, take our puzzled complaints and problems to God and leave them with him as we wait. In chapter 2 and verses 1 to 4, while in a state of listening, Habakkuk receives a vision which he was told to write down. He foresaw that judgment was coming on the ungodly Babylonians. He also foresaw that one day the Babylonians would be destroyed and the earth would be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's a refrain that we've heard before. I'm not sure if you've always wondered where it's come from. He foresaw the ultimate triumph of God over evil. Until that time, he resolved to wait for the answer, to to stay close to God and to trust him whatever happened. In this period of waiting, there is a shift. Habakkuk doesn't get the answer that he was looking for, but he clings to his faith. He knows that God is in charge. He is righteous, faithful, all-powerful and knowing and sovereign. He keeps coming back to three words but the Lord, but the Lord. But the Lord is in his holy temple. 
let all the earth be silent before him. He's able to begin to move from wrestling with God to befriending God in his circumstances, which were only going to get harder. In his remarkable prayer in chapter 3, he offers us some life-giving lessons to befriending our adverse circumstances. So lesson number one, remember. In chapter 3 and verse 2 we read, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time make them known. In wrath remember mercy. In this movement from doubt to faith, Habakkuk's prayer lists some tangible and visible places and events that trigger spiritual memories, where God's presence seemed more real than now, where he was doing big things. So, for example, Timon and Mount Paran are places where the Israelites took refuge after God delivered them from the bondage of exile in Egypt. Recently, my youngest daughter sent me a photo of a lunchbox she found in a shop in Abu Dhabi with the owl and the pussycat on it. Our kids love the story, and it instinctively connects them to their history, their childhood, their family, their home. This prayer helps us recall our own key memories, people, places, Moments in time, provisions that reveal the bigger picture of God's presence in our lives rather than a short-sighted focus on our immediate distressing circumstances. When you're in the valley, you remember what God has done and you dare to believe that what he's done before, he will do again. Lesson number two. Accept. After Habakkuk questioned God and got his message that he was going to use the wicked Babylonians to destroy Israel, he says in verse 16, I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. He had that sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach, realizing that God was using his worst enemy to destroy them. He thinks this is not going to be a fun season. Probably I'll die. I don't like it. But I just must receive what God is doing, even though I don't fully understand it. As Kevin shared with us a few days ago, it's a bit like placing the situation under the blessing. Uh, Lesson number three, trust. Reacting physically to the awful news, Habakkuk's confronted with the choice to trust his own emotions and view of the situation or to trust that God would somehow work out a good plan from the inconceivable scenario where the Babylonians were going to invade the land. He praised this amazing response to the worst possible news that he could have received from God. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive tree fail and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. Able to barely stand, having heard the devastating news, and with hard times only to get worse, he's able to say essentially, God is good. He chose to trust above any evidence. It seems somewhat trite and formulaic, but Habakkuk encourages us to remember what God has done, to accept what God is doing, and to trust what God is going to do. This is why Habakkuk's name means both to wrestle and to embrace. 
It's a faith that questions and yet trusts God even though the situation may not change. In his book, Craig Grishel tells the story of Anthony Graves. He was wrongly accused of killing six people. Given the death sentence, he received his execution date not once, but twice, with a stay of execution just days before his planned death. He was eventually exonerated and released after the Attorney General cited misconduct by the trial prosecutor. He suffered gross injustice, a wrecked reputation, and lost nearly 20 years of his life. Despite the odds, Anthony Graves is one of the most positive people around. He never lost his faith, but he wrestled with God before realizing God had never abandoned him and would bring something good out of his terrible ordeal. Today he speaks, he blogs, and he writes about prison reform, capital punishment, and the legal system. His story impacts thousands. His faith in Jesus is absolutely evident. He knows what it means to have hope when there's every reason to despair. But I prefer another story that Craig Grishel tells because it's possibly closer to our own lived experience. It's about a school friend who repeatedly cheated on his wife until she left him. He returned to God, but his life remained a mess. There is no evidence his life will improve, but he isn't giving up, and he's trusting God for the strength to carry him through the pain of an unrestored marriage, angry kids, and a purposeless life. There is no miracle story yet. But the Lord is on his throne. He is faithful, and so there is hope that God will bring a restoration. Habakkuk concludes, verse 19, The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Weighed down by his circumstances, what a statement of faith. To be sure-footed and light-hearted. One who is about to rise up out of a valley of despair and desolation to reach the mountaintop. And so to return to my question at the beginning, is it possible to find hope in the darkness? The disciples on the road to Emmaus return to Jerusalem sure-footed and light-hearted. They were transformed from, but we had hoped that, to were not our hearts burning within us. I continue to pray that my own difficulties would help me to develop hind's feet so that I can walk and progress through my troubles and suffering like Edith Eager, Nadia Murad, and Nikki Nichols. But if I am honest, instead I wrestle like the father of the boy with an evil spirit in Mark 9, verse 24. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. In the end, paralleling the powerful story of Habakkuk, the message of Easter proclaims that the most terrible and unjust thing that ever happened is the most wonderful thing that ever happened. There is hope in the darkness. The cross was not the end of the story. In God's righteous and wise plan, this dark and disastrous moment of death was at the same time a moment of life. This hopeless moment was the moment when eternal hope was given.